Okay, we, we can start. For, for detailed information about the United Nations Security Council, you can just uh, either use this link or just Google uh, UNSCOM and you will have ample information, lots of information about the United Nations Special Commission. And as I said, for things that they have done, for things that UNSCOM has achieved or has not been able to achieve, has been at the center of uh, a stiff debate. And uh, UNSCOM's purpose, status, things that they have done, and some of its inspectors have been uh, specifically uh, discussed very much, actually, at least uh, in the international forum among scholars, experts. Well, this is something that has lasted for about uh, like nine, nine years or so, from April 1991 till another United Nations Security Council Resolution 1284, uh, December 17th, 1999. So approximately for nine years and more, nine and a half years, Auscom uh, operated in the Iraqi territory. And as I said, the task of Auscom was to destroy, remove, or render harmless the chemical and biological weapons and all material that are used in the manufacturing of these weapons, technologies, as well as ballistic missiles whose ranges exceeded 150 kilometers. So ANSCOM, which was created anew from nothing, from scratch, uh, ANSCOM brought together a number of experts, technicians, scholars, those who were known to have a lot of knowledge about chemical and biological weapons, their systems of manufacturing systems, as well as ballistic missiles. And there were Hundreds of them, over a long period of time, as I said, for about nine and a half years, have gone on several occasions, or for several missions, have gone to, uh, to Iraq. For instance, uh, one of, when I was doing my postdoctoral uh, research at the Monterey Institute in California, uh, there was there a friend, Tim McCarty, who, was, who had some 13 missions in Iraq. He was dealing with uh, ballistic missile capability of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, and he was, he had taken a very significant role in the destruction, removal, or rendering harms of his, uh, Iraq's ballistic missile capability. And he was one of the most wanted by Saddam, and he was proud of this. So, um, Tim and I, when we sat and talked about things that were going on in Iraq, and he was, of course, depicting a situation which was not very much promising in terms of uh, ANSCOM achieving all its goal. Because one of the major reasons for this was at the beginning when Iraq was uh, uh, you know, uh, just defeated, uh, when uh, of course the wounds were fresh and uh, they were in a, uh, in a very vulnerable situation at the beginning, 91, 92, 93, they could not resist any demands coming from ANSCOM because ANSCOM was the almost the absolute you know, uh, authority in Iraq. And with the resolution 687, would you mind please closing the door? Uh, with the resolution 687, Iraq was asked to cooperate, collaborate with the uh, special commission people unconditionally. I mean, without you know, resisting to any demands that might be coming. Of course, uh, from ANSCOM, of course, ANSCOM inspectors, as I said, who were drawn from a large pool of, inspect of uh, scientists, technicians, uh, experts uh, from a number of countries, European countries and, and other countries, United States in particular, uh, who were expected to, uh, of course, be uh, respectful to the mandate. Well, for several years, from 91 to 92, 93, 94, um, Iraq did not resist too much, comply with the requirements of ANSCOM inspections, and ANSCOM inspectors themselves have been true to their mandate and 
because they were getting a lot of cooperation from the Iraqi authorities, they were taken to the facilities where chemical weapons, biological uh, uh, chemical weapons, biological weapons were being produced. But of course, prior to the war, as I said, Iraq was suspected of developing nuclear weapons, and many people knew Iraq had chemical weapons because the world had seen during the Iran-Iraq war from 1980 to 1988 use of extensive use of chemical weapons in the battlefields by Iraq and uh, also there was uh, strong suspicions about uh, Iraqi uh, biological weapons capabilities and that uh, Iraq was suspected of having biological weapons laboratories, uh, research facilities and manufacturing facilities. But Iraq from the beginning Although accepted, and it had no other option but to accept that they, Iraq had chemical weapons as well as ballistic missiles, but always told the ANSCOM inspectors that they had no work whatsoever with respect to biological weapons. They always uh, denied all these allegations, uh, rejected all these allegations, and they said they were clean about biological weapons um, program. So they had no such a program, they said. But as I said, uh, based on the intelligence coming from uh, different sources, not from within ANSCOM, because ANSCOM was, again, a group of inspectors, technicians, experts who were put together to uh, execute the uh, mandate that were given uh, to them by United Nations Security Council Resolution 687, and as uh, uh, also explained in paragraphs 8, 9, and 10. So, and these people, of course, were taken to these facilities by Iraqi escorts. They were escorting the UN people from the headquarters, and they were taking these inspectors to facilities where Anscorn was supposed to destroy them. But since Iraq denied all these allegations that they had a chemical, uh, sorry, biological weapons program, but on the other, on the other hand, uh, inspectors, or at least some of them, had reasons to believe that Iraq had already embarked upon a biological weapons program and somewhere, hidden somewhere in, in the Iraqi territory, there were such laboratories and maybe stockpiling facilities as well as manufacturing facilities. They wanted to unearth this uh, you know, clandestine uh, capabilities or hidden capabilities of Iraq. And therefore, because Iraq did not cooperate enough, at least as much as the inspectors, ANSCOM inspectors expected from Iraq, some inspectors started to rely on intelligence coming from other sources, one of whom was this guy, as I showed you last time, Scott Wheeler. Well, that, that picture was taken later on. He put some weight, as far as I can see. And he was a Marine, uh, um, and he was, for several years, from 91 to mid-1990s, he was considered to be a hero among the inspectors because he was so efficient, according to some inspectors, as well as to some other sort of rumors, reports, whatever, uh, you know, reporting the situation on the ground, that he was so effective in uh, finding uh, these you know, hidden uh, material and he was using some methods to get intelligence, to get information from the Iraqis. And one of these methods was getting intelligence from uh, other intelligence agencies such as CIA of the United States and Mossad of Israel. That actually was not part of the mandate. ANSCOM inspectors were not allowed to share intelligence or use intelligence getting uh, coming from uh, other intelligence sources. Well. Maybe at the headquarters somewhere uh, in, in New York or maybe you know, uh, in other fora, uh, groups of uh, countries could come together and assemble a certain intelligence and provide ANSCOM. That might have been uh, compatible with the mandate, but individual inspectors establishing private links and connections, contacts with in, 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 uh, some intelligence uh, organizations and getting this intelligence and using this intelligence to find out some of the hidden facilities maybe by way of end product that is removal, destruction or random harms of Iraqi biological weapons capability 
I mean, the, 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 the end result might be fine. But the way you achieve this, the method that you use in, in achieving this goal was unacceptable. But you, I'll come back to this, but this guy was uh, quite instrumental in unearthing the hidden, the clandestine biological weapons program of Iraq by, through methods that he used. Although, as I said, what he found out was uh, significant for the world, but the method that he used and some of his colleagues have used was unacceptable from the uh, uh, point of view of uh, the mandate of the ANSCOM inspectors. So uh, according to uh, the um, job he, he did, actually Iraq was forced to sign the Biological Weapons Convention and they had, of course, before this, they had to accept that they, they lied to the international community in terms of not having any work with respect to biological weapons, and that they had in the past quite intensive work on biological weapons manufacturing. Well, this is, of course, a field which is not, not at all very easy, but provided that you have a certain basic infrastructure, certain equipment, of course, a certain degree of sophistication in terms of knowledge and technology, biological weapons are not that difficult. Well, some people say you can produce at home in your bathroom, or please don't try this at home, but this is not all that easy. But yet, it is not from uh, far from the reach of especially states, governments, and some non-state actors today. But this guy, as I said, was very uh, influential in figuring out the extent of Iraq's biological weapons program, but again, for reasons that he uh, adopted, and, and used, uh, ANSCOM has encountered troubles. And Saddam Hussein, once he understood that some of the ANSCOM inspectors were in contact with intelligence services such as Mossad and CIA and maybe others, he made this a case. He started to complain about it. He complained not only you know, uh, to his own people publicly, but also to the world, and said, Look, yes, we are under sanctions. I understand it. You impose these sanctions. You, you know, uh, send these inspectors. But these inspectors are out of their way. I mean, uh, just cross the line. And therefore, the, the, what they do is not acceptable. So uh, I will not cooperate again. So Iraqi uh, authorities leadership, Saddam Hussein, said that he would not cooperate with ANSCO. Of course, at, at that moment, the situation may not have been properly understood by, by everybody. And when Iraq said uh, it would not cooperate with ANSCOM inspections, uh, that was found as something which would be contradictory to what was asked in the UN Security Council Resolution 687, which was unconditional cooperation with ANSCOM. So Iraq, by any means, I mean, could not uh, argue that it, it, it was not going to cooperate because it had accepted a priori at the beginning with paragraph 33 uh, in, uh, uh, as a condition of ceasefire that it would uh, cooperate with the uh, inspections and everything. So, and when he uh, direct, uh, when Saddam Hussein directed his feet and just uh, did not want to cooperate on the grounds that ANSCOM inspectors were uh, crossing the line and where we were just going beyond their mandate and they were doing things that would not be acceptable, uh, the United States threatened with retaliation, with, with counteraction, and there was a short-lived, um, or sh uh, for a short period of time, uh, what was known as the Operation Desert Fox. Uh, and in order to persuade Saddam Hussein that he should continue to cooperate with ANSCO without creating any number of uh, other demands. Then, of course, this Operation Desert Fox convinced Saddam Hussein, at least, that he should continue to allow inspectors uh, continue to do their job. But from that point onwards, frictions have always been there between Iraqis and the inspectors. And in the meantime, as I was explaining, uh, or just uh, briefly mentioned, Iraq was under heavy sanctions all-out sanctions, comprehensive sanctions, almost every single item that were uh, needed in the daily lives of uh, you know, people in the street, uh, men, women, elderly, women, children, 
So uh, they were all under sanctions and they were being scrutinized very, very uh, carefully. And as, that, as I said, like many people agree, the sanctions themselves, in the eyes of many people, uh, have become weapon of mass destruction for the Iraqi people. And as I said, figures vary and according to different sources, but hundreds of thousands of people uh, have lost their lives because of some illnesses that could not be cured because of lack of medication or proper uh, food uh, which was lacking, etc., etc. So these were the humanitarian dimensions of the problem, which under the context of what was going on, and when, when people were so focused on uh, getting rid of Saddam Hussein's such and such capabilities, people's attention was not yet that much confined to the situation on the ground as to what was happening to uh, innocent people or ordinary people uh, on the ground. And that issue gained further momentum with some uh, uh, organizations, uh, non-governmental organizations taking the lead and, and uh, thinking out of the box and, and trying to see behind the walls as to what exactly uh, or how exactly Iraqi people were being affected. Because, I mean, there, there was this uh, wholesome approach uh, in the world that Iraq meant uh, Saddam Hussein and Saddam Hussein meant Iraq, period. No, that was not issue. There was a man at the top and there were uh, approximately 20 million people in Iraq who were trying to make a living, who were trying to survive under all these sanctions and many of whom had nothing to do with Iraqi policies or Saddam Hussein's policies. And, uh, and all the more so, many of whom were already being persecuted or were uh, sort of uh, uh, subject to very bad treatment uh, in terms of, you know, uh, I don't know, tortures or uh, just maybe uh, killings, assassinations, or at the least, at the minimum, dislocation uh, from their homes uh, sent uh, to other places because Saddam Hussein wanted to play with or manipulate the demographic uh, structure of Iraq all through his uh, years in power, starting from, of course, early 1970s, but, and then seized power in 1979 as the one man, and then until uh, uh, the 2003 war. So these issues were undermined, and people were fixated to what was going on with the ANSCOM inspections, and because reports coming every six months from ANSCOM reporting that, while well, we have gone there in such and such place, we have destroyed such and such amount of this, such and such amount of that, and we have debriefed such and such number of uh, uh, scientists, uh, Iraqi scientists, and we have learned such and such information, this and that. So these six monthly um, reports you can find on the internet if you like, and, and these are lengthy reports, uh, sometimes uh, uh, several hundred pages, and uh, we're you know, explaining the situation in very much detail. But Again, uh, because of this, uh, especially in the aftermath of unearthing uh, biological weapons capabilities of Iraq, by way of getting some of the intelligence from some uh, intelligence organizations, that was not necessarily uh, approvable with the mandate of uh, uh, the inspectors given by UN Security Council 687. Then, for the second time, when frictions continued between Iraqi authorities and the inspectors, uh, at some point the inspections came to a halt, just stopped, almost stopped, because uh, Iraq or Saddam Hussein was employing certain methods such as not issuing visas to inspectors. I mean, because when we talk about inspectors, we're not talking about the very same people for all these years. I mean. There's a group of people, like 50 of them, assembled in the United Nations, uh, uh, you know, headquarters in, in, in New York, for instance, dispatched to Iraq, stay there for maybe weeks, months, uh, I don't think years, or even if they stay for extended periods, they go back and forth, and then, you know, after some time, new uh, people come, replace them, and conduct inspections where, uh, from the point that they were left and things like that. And, but each new inspector had to uh, receive a visa, and in the past, Iraqi authorities were issuing visa rather quickly, swiftly, but this time, 
they, you know, delayed uh, the, this visa procedure. That was one of them. Secondly, uh, those who were supposed to be escorting the inspectors, because we're talking about Americans, French, or maybe Japanese inspectors, I mean, not necessarily uh, the same uh, this group, but, you know, a typical group of inspectors. Um, they are in the Iraqi territory, they don't know where to go. They are, and probably at that time they did not have this uh, navigation uh, instruments in their cars. And so they, were, they needed escorts uh, uh, from the Iraqi government for basically two reasons. First, of course, to find their ways to the facility in which they would find and destroy some chemical, biological weapons or missile. And, of course, for protection. After all, Iraq was not a uh, 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 heaven, as you can imagine, after the war. And there were too many militia all around. And there was this, a certain degree of uh, anarchy in the streets. And, and it was not safe. It was not a safe environment for inspectors to wander around on their own. So they had to be taken to certain places, escorting was necessary, and you know, brought back to their uh, secured um, headquarters within Iraq. And this escort was of vital importance for inspectors uh, to, uh, and for the inspect inspections to continue. So after this Desert Fox, which convinced Saddam Hussein that he should continue to um, uh, let the inspectors uh, do their job, again, uh, rumors or information uh, coming from the floor, from the ground, uh, was continuing with respect to inspectors cooperating with other intelligence services. And this time, Saddam Hussein said, okay, that's it, period. I'm putting a halt to providing escorts to inspectors. If they, they want to carry on, they are free to carry on, but I'm not giving any more escorts. So if you were the United Na uh, Nations Secretary General, Charla, then if you were, again, at that time, the UN Secretary General, your inspectors, because that was a UN body, Anscom was a property of the United Nations, let's say, and these inspectors are not given any more escorts, what would you do? Would you still ask them to continue their job, or what else you would do instead? Well, uh, the United Nations Secretary General took a very wise decision and actually took a decision that he could take, the only decision that was, to ask them to stop their inspections. Because without escorts, you cannot operate, you cannot find your place, even if you found, how, who would provide security? And if one, one or more of the inspectors were shot and dead, by some militia people. Or, you know, if there was, for instance, a confrontation at one of the facilities and people did not want to let inspectors in, and of course, inspectors were carrying maybe some guns and some other stuff. Uh, I cannot comment on that. But if, you know, some, something happened and one or more of inspectors just lost their lives, who would be responsible? Of course, the UN Secretary General would assume responsibility and therefore, he withdrew the inspectors. So when we come to uh, the end of 1998, actually, and 99, we there is this, uh, you know, uh, they put a halt to the inspections. And uh, by the end of 1998, of course, uh, inspections have achieved a great deal. As I said, IAEA finished the job much earlier, as uh, early as 1995. Iraqi nuclear infrastructure was almost uh, rendered harmless. And the material that was necessary, some of the enriched uranium, highly enriched uranium, and some amount, a certain amount of plutonium, I guess, uh, were taken out of the country. And some of the instruments, some of the uh, other stuff were just either destroyed or rendered harmless. Nuclear job was fine, and the IAEA had gone home earlier, but ANSCOM, because of all these problems, and many more. I mean, this is just uh, a very uh, brief uh, executive summary of what happened there. And then Ascom was um, somewhat worn out, was somehow 
corrupt and uh, it also lost its uh, credentials or credibility in terms of finishing the job and that you know and also trustability so and because Saddam is saying threatened with uh, not providing escort to the inspectors of course the UN Secretary General had taken the only decision that he could take which was to uh, take them out of the country probably they went first to Jordan I, I can remember exactly but inspectors were not anymore operating in the Iraqi territory and, and by the end of 1998 as I said even though a great deal of job was done um, not everything was accomplished so we understand this from reports that were um, issued by the ANSCOM uh, I mean first director Rolf Ekeus and the other second director uh, Richard Butler you've seen these, their pictures uh, last time so then of course uh, there was nothing throughout 1999 there was almost nothing uh, in, in Iraq that was not acceptable from uh, the perspective of the the, the free world uh, which I mean who had committed itself um, to cleaning the Iraqi territory from all these weapons so the world wanted to make sure that Iraq was clean and they also wanted to see uh, that you know that job was accomplished but for a reason that I explained that was not the case of course the, this being the case on the other hand I mean all through the 1990s the whole world was discussing the misery that the you know ordinary people the citizens of Iraq were uh, undergoing were experiencing all through these years because of lack of food medicine and anything under heavy sanctions under not at all any smart sanctions and comprehensive sanctions and um, all these you know civilian casualties because of lack of food medication as I said and the world was discussing other issues one of which of course in, in, in between these these years uh, the world also witnessed things that have happened in Rwanda in Africa and also in uh, in former Yugoslavia so the world's attention was uh, attracted by other developments and Iraq was somewhat a routine as sometimes this routine was uh, broken with some uh, developments the pop-up developments like you know Scott Ritter's uh, uh, you know statements or some allegations about you know Anscom's corruption etc etc but what and the world uh, and many countries uh, who had their representatives at the United Nations and the United Nations Security Council such as France for instance started to question the validity of sanctions and the, uh, the effectiveness of what was being done and of course the lack of inspections left things in limbo I mean uh, the job was not accomplished so the United Nations had to take a decision first and foremost to finish the job that was started back in 1991 687 and also to put an end to the misery of a civilian people so for this reason the United Nations Security Council took a decision uh, I hope uh, I can find here um, where is it well it's uh, 1284 I may have difficulty finding right now I uh, this December 17th, no board marker. Well, December 17th, 17, uh, there's no December 17th anyway. Um, 1999, the United Nations Security Council adopted the resolution 1284 1284. And this resolution is very important. First of all, by adopting this resolution, the United Nations system acknowledged that. ANSCOM, which it had created with United Nations Security Council Resolution 687, was corrupt, went, went out of line, went beyond the mandate, and that what ANSCOM did, well, in some respects, was, of course, uh, amend, uh, commendable and, and acceptable, but what some of the things that they have done was not acceptable. So, therefore, UN Security Council Resolution 1284 
um, the sold ANSCO, just abolished ANSCO. It says no more ANSCO. And now we're putting, but since the job is unfinished, I mean, ANSCOM has left at a certain point without, you know, uh, sort of wrapping up the, 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 uh, the mandate and say, okay, here, what we have done and finished the job. No, that was not the situation. And since the, the job was not finished, the job had to be finished. And ANSCOM being corrupt and abolished, there, must, there was need for another institution, another sort of a, a group of inspectors, but this time consisting of good guys, nice guys, not corrupt guys. And so that was the United Nations uh, Commission for uh, Monitoring and Verification Inspection Commission, UNMOVIC. United Nations Monitoring Verification Inspection Commission, UNMOVIC, U-N-M-O-V-I-C. Well, imagine I have this board mark here, UNMOVIC. <laughs> All right, whoops. All right, uh, so Anmovic was created with 1284, and Anmovic and, 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 and was, of course, I mean, the former inspectors, not all of them, I mean, that was not an all-out blaming of every single Anscom inspectors for having involved in corrupt you know, relations, etc. No, some of them were accused of having some you know, uh, illegitimate connection with in, uh, in, uh, intelligence services. And many of them were praised for the job that they have done, commended, and they were thanked for, for the job that, they, that they, they have done. But all in all, ANSCOM did not exist. Some of the former ANSCOM inspectors also had uh, uh, you know, duties or responsibilities within UNMOVIC, but most of the UNMOVIC uh, inspectors were again brought from a large pool of technicians, experts, and specialists. And I can tell you, uh, this may not be written anywhere, but I can tell you that for almost each and every UNMOVIC uh, inspector, Iraqi's consent was sought, well, de facto, not necessarily this is something that is acknowledged, but uh, behind the doors, there was some uh, negotiations with, with the Iraqi authorities as to whether they would have any concerns about any particular inspector that, who would take part in the Anmovic missions. Yet, uh, and, and this uh, Anmovic was created, and in addition to that, taking into consideration all the sufferings of the Iraqi people, the world had come to the point of acknowledging better and better and more and more that sanctions actually did not stop Saddam Hussein from doing what he was doing anyway. And that sanctions were not uh, limiting his uh, uh, ambitions or whatever he was doing, but rather putting heavy pressure on uh, daily life on the ordinary people. Therefore, Saddam Hussein or Iraq was offered something very, very uh, interesting, which was I mean, the United Nations Security Council said to Saddam, all right, you uh, claim at the beginning that ANSCOM was corrupt, and now we figure out that you were right. We abolish ANSCOM, now we create a new uh, inspection mechanism, a, a, a new body of inspectors. All of them good guys, you will not have complained, you, they will not have any uh, uh, relations with any of the intelligence services, etc. We, we sort of guarantee you. but." In return for you to accept these guys to Iraq and giving them escort so that they finish their job, the job that was left unfinished by ANSCOM, if you let them go Iraq, operate in the field, and finish the job as the mandate as uh, envisaged in 687, then starting from that day onwards, until they finish the job and you come clean, I mean, your territory become, becomes clean. We will suspend the sanctions. Of course, sanctions that would have uh, relevance to people's daily lives. I mean, not sanctions on weapons, but sanctions on food, medication, and some other material. So that was a very generous offer. Well, 
for, looked at the issue from humanitarian pers perspective, maybe it was not that enough. But when you consider or bear in mind what was written back in 87, I mean, um, 687, I mean, UN Security Council Resolution 687, Iraq was asked to unconditionally cooperate with, with the inspectors. So United Nations Security Council might have very well uh, uh, insisted that, I mean, I have abolished ANSCOM and now you have to take Amnovic without any questions. But of course, UN Security Council also figured out the situation on the ground. Thank you, Coral. Teşekkürler. <laughs> All right. So now we have an unmovic. Well, United Nations Monitoring Verification Inspection Commission, which was created with the UN Security Council Resolution 1284, dated December. 17, 1999. So, with this resolution, Anovic was created, Anscom gone uh, out of window, and Iraq was offered a kind of deal, and the deal was in return for Iraq's acceptance of Anovic and uh, to continue the unfinished job or the job that was unfinished by ANSCOM, sanctions that were imposed on Iraq would be lifted during all this period that ANSCOM would operate and would bring the mandate to an end. Because remember, Resolution 687 is a ceasefire resolution, and ceasefire is an interim solution. It's not an end solution. It's not the ultimate solution. There is still war conditions. War is not brought to an end with a peace treaty. There is no peace treaty. So ANSCOM and IAEA were given the task of clearing the Iraqi territory from all the weapons of mass destruction and their infrastructure. And after that, Iraq would be clean and would sign a peace treaty with Kuwait, with coalition forces, and Iraq would come clean and become again a noble member of the international community. But this job was unfinished because of all this and that, that I, the whole story I try to explain here. Anscom Un, Un, was corrupt at some point, and then Anloic was created, and therefore for the ceasefire to sort of come to an end with the execution of Anloic's mandate, the unfinished mandate of Anscom, then of course Iraq was supposed to uh, sign a peace treaty. And for this to happen, Anmovic had to continue from the point that was left unfinished by an Anscom. And Iraq was given a deal, was given an offer to let these guys in the Iraqi territory. Because again, for the same for the very same reasons that Anscom could not operate, because Iraq was uh, not giving any more escorts I mean, the, the sort of uh, Iraqi people who would guide them all through the uh, Iraqi territory and also uh, uh, protect them. Anmovic also needed this escort. Without these uh, Iraqi escort units, Anmovic could not go to Iraq and could not operate there. So Saddam Hussein was asked to let Anmovic in, let them operate, finish the job, and, uh, and until such time, Iraq would be uh, uh, would not suffer anymore from such sanctions who affected people's daily life. That was a very good deal indeed, but Saddam Hussein did not accept. He said there will be another intervention in the sovereignty, etc., etc., of Iraq. And this Almovic was never able to go to Iraq until 2002 November. And therefore, the UN Security Council Resolution 1284 was not put in practice starting from end of 1998 till from December 98 to uh, November 2002 for almost exactly four years, or to be exact, 47 months. Iraqi ter territory was not being inspected, was not being uh, sort of uh, clean from whatever was left um, in, the, in, the, in the facilities. 
So what is important here, and this is something, I mean, now we go beyond the context of Iraq. I mean, so far, we have discussed the situation in Iraq, the United Nations Security Council resolutions, implementations, non-implementations, this and that. But what was the, or what were the consequences of all this for the rest of the world and for the rest of the story? Because the Iraqi story, at least Saddam Hussein's story, continued until the day he was, of course, executed. After, soon after the war, he was uh, seized, uh, was arrested uh, in, in place where he was uh, hiding away. But from, just to remind you, thank you, Coral. <laughs> 1990, this is an imaginary board marker. I'm just <laughs> trying to figure out what I'm writing here. Uh, no, no, fine, it's okay. Uh, I mean, this is the time when inspectors were withdrawn from Iraq. And in January 99, oops, there is this UN Security Council meeting which was attended by Richard Butler. And he presented his report. And that report was adopted with the unanimity of votes. And December uh, 1999, this UN Security Council Resolution 1284. Um, and November 2002, Anmovic in Iraq. Well, of course, in December 99, as I said, when Saddam Hussein was given a deal, was offered a deal to accept Almovic inspectors to finish the job and in return for which sanctions would be lifted, suspended, not lifted, but suspended, which would, of course, make uh, life much more easier for most of the Iraqi people. But he declined to accept. He did not accept on the grounds that it would be another way of intervening or intervention in the Iraqi sovereignty. And therefore, from December 98 and onwards, when inspectors were out of Iraqi territory, until November 2002, Anmovic, which was created in December 99, could not go to the Iraqi territory. And in the meantime, as I said, there was this January 99 meeting of U.S. Security Council, where ANSCOM, the last second and the last director of uh, ANSCOM, Richard Butler, uh, presented his report, which was adopted by the U.S. Security Council resolution, uh, U.S. Security Council members. And in that report, well, this is the most controversial part. And even just uh, this February, this year in Paris. And you have seen the picture, uh, me, Butler, and Orlov. Um, as, remember I said, you know, <laughs> these people looked like drunk, but because after 10, 12 hours of work, people were really exhausted. I had a chance to discuss again, uh, because I had a chance to discuss with him in March 99 at the Wilton Park meeting, <coughs> and then uh, this year, earlier this year, as to whether what he wrote in his report had any um, consequences or anything to do with the decisions that were taken by the United States in, in terms of intervening in, the, in, in, in Iraq. He, of course, uh, said you know, that was not at all his intention. And, and things that he wrote about the situation in Iraq uh, be, were based on the information that he had at the time. Of course, this is a very long report, 120 or so pages. And it's you know, uh, in a very detailed expose of what was done and what was the situation at the time when they, they had to leave. Because ANSCOM had to leave uh, with, in, on a short notice uh, without making the necessary uh, preparations for leaving or maybe to finishing the job. So he says, I'm, I'm paraphrasing or some, very much summari summarizing. He says, I mean, we have destroyed this much amount of this and that. And I mean, 
we have concerns about some material remaining in Iraq which may have weapons implications especially chemical material and some chemical weapons because you know what it is not that easy to have an exact estimate or exact figure about how much of which weapon category a particle country may have or how many of them um, even in some time you know in mid 1990s several years after the Soviet Union collapsed and I share this with my arms control disarmament uh, class students uh, person who was in charge of the uh, former Soviet nuclear warheads sometime in 96 or so he says well we have 30,000 plus or minus 5,000 nuclear warheads I mean how can you not count the exact number of nuclear warheads and these are uh, hell of a weapon I mean these are very very you know, important weapons so when it comes to chemical biological weapons we're talking about chemical substances biological agents I mean whose exact amount may not be properly known at any given time so therefore and in a country like Iraq where you may not uh, totally trust the accountancy system or they may not even have this uh, material accounting and control system in properly placed everywhere in the country so it was very difficult for the ANSCOM inspectors to make a exact of a good estimate of how much of chemical weapons that Iraq had were destroyed or how much of this amount was not destroyed yet or and how much raw material or material that could be weaponized that could be uh, produced into chemical weapons were, were in the, uh, still live, uh, left in the country. The same also applies to uh, biological agents. Even with respect to ballistic missiles, which are very, very important weapon systems, they, they were not properly counted because nobody knew the exact number of ballistic missiles uh, of Iraq and how many of them were destroyed and how many were left undestroyed. So therefore, you, it is not that easy and it would not be fair to put to, to put the blame on Richard Butler as many people did back in the night, late 99 and early 2000s but I mean Iraq was a very difficult country but the report suggested that I mean the, the sort of the uh, the very uh, uh, meaning or one's understanding of this report was that the job was unfinished meaning still weapons or material that could be weaponized were remaining there so that was as I said adopted with unanimity awards at the session of, of the meeting where the Iraqi representative was also present to, uh, as an observer so from this point onwards until November 2002 for 47 months Iraq was not inspected no inspections whatsoever was carried out in Iraq so this is significant and this had uh, been uh, the, the subject of very much controversy because in the meantime several things happened I mean now we are concentrating on Iraq but what else uh, has happened the war in, 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 uh, in former Yugoslavia, Kosovo, uh, the NATO, of course, uh, a new mandate and strategic concept, and also some other developments that have distracted the attention of the, the UN people. And, of course, 9-11. And after 9-11, the United States first uh, confined its attention to Afghanistan, but then turned to Iraq. And after Iraq was put on the radar screen, a target, many of the developments have gained momentum. And these, of course, have paved the way to Almovic putting its foot on the Iraqi territory in November 2002. But controversies, let alone disappearing, uh, gain uh, further momentum as well. And therefore, this is the subject of our discussion on Friday, starting at 9.40.